Hello everyone, thank you for tuning in today. My name is Ian and you're watching Big Rock Outdoors, formerly Big Rock Media. So it's been about one year since I bought this, Jeep's 2021 Gladiator Rubicon. Over the past year, I've used this truck to do just about everything from serious off-roading, to hauling around my family, to getting groceries, to towing a travel trailer, towing a motorcycle trailer, going overland style camping with a rooftop tent, and just about everything in between. Now, if you're looking for just another quick drive review or a test drive review, or like a clickbait video with some half naked girl running around, this isn't it. We're gonna go in depth. I'm gonna really tell you honestly how this Gladiator has performed over the past year and how it compares to other trucks and SUVs that I've owned. Here's how I'm gonna break down this video. First, I'm gonna talk about why I chose to get a Jeep Gladiator. Then I'm gonna talk about why I chose the Rubicon trim level and also why I chose the 3.6 liter gas engine and not the diesel. Then I'm gonna give you a short interior and exterior tour and talk about what I like about the interior and the exterior of the truck. We're gonna talk about how the truck performs off-road and we're gonna talk about how is it to live with the Gladiator on a day-to-day -day basis doing normal stuff. We'll talk about how it drives on the highway, on the roads, on the freeways. Then we'll talk about how does this thing do with towing with larger trailers and smaller trailers. Then we'll talk about what are my favorite and least favorite things about the Jeep Gladiator. And then we'll end with some final thoughts and talk about would I buy this vehicle again. I hope you're ready because we're about to dive in and go in depth on this Gladiator. If you're considering purchasing one of these trucks, this is the video for you. So stay tuned and let's get started. So why did I purchase the Jeep Gladiator? There's really four big main factors that went into my decision to get this vehicle. The first thing is the versatility of this truck. Now notice sometimes they call it a truck, sometimes they call it a Jeep, and that's exactly the point. For years, I wanted a Jeep Wrangler, but frankly, the Jeep Wrangler doesn't offer enough practicality for me. It doesn't have enough storage space. It doesn't have the towing capacity. It doesn't have the truck bed to haul trash and things like that, or things from Home Depot. So I really wanted something that could do a little bit of everything. That could do serious off-roading and overlanding camping. That could tow small trailers, even travel trailers. I wanted something that I could put my wife and my child in the back. I wanted something with a truck bed that I could load up the back of it with dirty stuff. I live up here in the mountains. We have to haul our trash to the dump and I haul motorcycles or other things that I need to do. And I just needed something that uh, really combined the best of like a truck and what's always been an amazing vehicle, which is the Jeep Wrangler. The second big factor that went into the decision, and I think that this may seem obvious, but it's a really important thing, and that's the cool factor of this vehicle. Now, most people, what happens is you spend 40, 50, $60,000 or even more on a car, and it's just a car. It's just an appliance, something that you need, something that you use. It's kind of boring, but this is not boring. This is the opposite of boring. Every time I get out of this thing and walk away from it in a parking lot or even park it in my driveway here, I turn around and look at it because I mean, the blue color helps, but it's just an awesome looking vehicle, especially with a few small mods. Now this cool factor that I'm talking about, it has not worn off over the past year. It's really just as strong as it was when I bought it and maybe even more because I've done a few customizations to it. But the way I see it, if you're gonna spend so much money on a vehicle and have this huge payment or go out of pocket for this huge amount of money, why not buy something that you really connect with almost on an emotional level, something that has a personality and the Jeep has a ton of that. The third factor for me is the resale value. In case I change my mind or my needs change, I wanna do something different, then I will be able to turn around and sell this thing for a very high percentage of what I paid for it brand new. And that's very, very important to me because I'm somebody who looks at the cost of ownership, not just the purchase price. So the cost to own a vehicle is the depreciation, the insurance, the maintenance, things like that. Not really what you paid for it. So in that case, the Jeep does very, very well. It has one of the highest resale values of any vehicle. So your actual ownership cost isn't that high, even though the transaction price, the purchase price seems pretty high. 
The fourth reason that I bought a Gladiator is the customization potential, and this is a big deal. If you look at my Jeep, although this is not a video talking about all the mods, you can see I've done things like wheels and tires, I've done a winch, I've done you know some stuff on the back with the half rack and the rooftop tent and some accessories like that. You can customize this to your heart's content, you can make it your own, and you can have that connection to a vehicle that's personalized just for you. The Jeep aftermarket world is insane, completely insane, and there's an old saying that Jeep means just empty every pocket, right, Jeep? And I think that's true. You can certainly go crazy with buying things from the catalog, um, but what I find is just doing a few tasteful things can make it your own, customize it the way you want, but the ability to keep changing things and keep modifying things on a vehicle um, so you don't get bored with it over the years is a really big deal, and it's not something you find on a lot of vehicles out there. So why did I purchase the Rubicon trim level over the other trim levels? And also let's talk about why I made the choice of the gas engine versus the diesel engine. So let's cover the Rubicon first. So this is not a video going into detail on all the trim levels, but you know, you've got the Sport, you've got the Willis package, you've got the uh, Overland, you've got the Mojave and the Rubicon. The Rubicon is kind of the top dog in terms of the off-road kind of rock crawling equipment that it has. Um, so there's a few things that I liked about the Rubicon. One was, I just like the way that the trim package looks. I like the kind of the louvers on top of the hood. I think it looks awesome. And you can see that when you're driving, it just gives you a sense that you're in something special. Um, of course, I like the badging, but really why you get the Rubicon is for a few things. You get a front locking differential. Um, some of the other trims come with a rear locker. I believe the Mojave does. But to get a front locking differential, which adds some serious rock crawling capabilities or ability to get through deep snow or deep mud, you have to get the Rubicon to get that. The other thing that the Rubicon has is the electronic disconnecting sway bar. And that is a critical, critical piece of equipment to have. Now you can do that in the aftermarket if you get a Jeep without it. But the reason that's so nice is that it allows extreme levels of articulation of the front suspension. So going through extremely uh, rough Jeep trails and fire roads and huge ruts and rocks, the articulation is simply out of this world on this vehicle. And having that button you can just push to disconnect your sway bar is a game changing thing. It's awesome and I love it and I would never go back. Some other things with the Rubicon that are worth mentioning, the gear ratio is different. So I believe it's a 410 or it's a 430. I'll correct that here in the text. Um, it's one of those, but it gives you a better gear ratio um, for cr rock crawling and that low end torque, that low end power that you need. The other thing nice about that is that when you do go, which a lot of people do, to a larger tire, I've got 35s on here. Some people go to 37s or even 40s. Um, you can get away with 35s and 37s for the most part without re-gearing if you have that 410 Rubicon gearing. If you have a different trim level with the um, taller, more highway oriented gearing, and then you try to put on larger tires and a lift, um, it's not going to perform well. You're going to really suffer on the performance and you're going to need to re-gear the vehicle. Um, and that's going to cost you around $1,500 to $2,000 to have that done. But if you get the Rubicon, you can do 35s or 37s and keep the stock 410 gearing and be pretty good uh, with that gearing. All right, so why did I choose the Pentastar 3.6 liter V6 gas engine over the eco diesel engine. So really for me, it comes down to simplicity, reliability, and weight. So the gas engine is lighter, which means that the vehicle has more payload. If you look at the payload sticker, which is the weight that you're allowed to carry uh, in the bed and with your passengers, and if you're towing a trailer, that hitch weight is gonna take up some of that payload, the gas Gladiators have a lot more payload than the diesel ones do because the diesel engine is heavier. So that makes sense. And so you get more payload with the gas. Um, simplicity and reliability. The Pentastar V6 is a very proven design. It's not the torquiest engine. We're going to cover that when I talk about the things I don't really like, but it's proven, it's simple, it's durable. They have very few failures on all the vehicles that these have gone in, and it's proven. It's been out for quite a long time. It's easy to work on, and you just don't have to worry about it. Let's talk a bit about the exterior and the styling of the Gladiator. So like I mentioned, the Gladiator comes in a lot of different trim levels and they look quite a bit different coming from the factory. Now here's the thing that I will say about the styling. Uh, when, when the vehicle first came out and I saw you know, the media stuff and the press releases and the teaser videos and all of that, and people started buying them, and also when I started to look at them in person, I didn't really like the looks of it. Something about it looked out of proportion, like it looked silly. And I think I figured out why. 
uh, it's much longer than something like a Jeep Wrangler. And what happens is the proportions are just out of whack from the way it looks from the factory. I'm not saying it doesn't function well, I'm just saying it doesn't look right. When you have like the small wheels and tires on it, and when you have, uh, you know, the, the kind of the nose down in the front like some of the trim levels have, it just looks like it's too long and too short and it just doesn't seem right. At least that's just my opinion, but I, but I think a lot of you probably would agree with me on that. Now, thankfully, this is pretty easily addressed by doing things like two inch lift, which is very popular, which actually I don't have, uh, doing things like larger tires, different wheels, just bringing the vehicle up a little bit higher and putting on some larger tires to fill out the wheel wells is, does um, incredible things. It's a complete revolution in the way the vehicle looks. So that's the nice thing about it. You can address that. Um, other than that, I really enjoy the styling of the Jeep, especially from like the, the front quarter angles and the front angle. Um, I love the, the classic Jeep grill. I talked about the hood already. I love that. Uh, the big fender flares coming out. It just looks aggressive and muscular, especially like I said, when you get it lifted up just a little bit from the factory look, especially with the chunkier tires. Now, before I go any further, there's a few things I want to mention. My Gladiator is pretty much fully loaded. I'll have a little photo of the window sticker here, but I pretty much got just about every option you can get, and that's exactly what I wanted. I also specifically wanted this hydro blue color. I think it looks absolutely incredible. Now you can get Gladiators with painted uh, fenders, color match fenders like this, or black fenders, and then for the hard top, which I did get the hard top and not the soft top, uh, you can get a uh, body color or you can get the black. I wanted the contrasting black of the hard top. I think that looks cool. And so I specifically searched out a Gladiator that had that. So what about the modifications that I've done to this? Just real briefly so you know what you're looking at. Uh, I've done a worn VR10 uh, Evo winch on the front using the factory uh, Jeep steel bumper that's winch ready, although you do have to buy a winch plate, which costs another... I forget, another 100 or 200 bucks to buy the winch plate. I've done uh, method wheels with 35 inch Cooper STT Pro mud terrain tires. Um, beyond that, I do have a fishbone off-road half rack in the bed. I have a Smitty built Gen 2 rooftop tent and I have separate videos on that. I'll link here. Um, I have a few things bolted to the rack. Um, but other than that, that's kind of it. I don't have any extra lights. I don't have any of the showy stuff that some uh, mall crawler Jeep people kind of do. I just have stuff that makes a vehicle more useful and that's a good value for money. One last thing I want to mention about the Gladiator, and this goes for all Jeeps, is that just research what top you want because uh, the top is a big compromise. If you get the soft top, you know, someone can cut into it. It's, uh, it, it's not as good with um, insulating you from road noise and weather and cold temperatures or hot temperatures. Uh, but the good thing about the soft top is you can flip it back and have an open roof pretty easily. The hard top, you do have those front freedom panels, which I do take off quite a bit and I enjoy that. But to take off the rear section of the hard top, uh, you're going to either have to have two people really to lift that off uh, or be like the size of a bear and super strong or have a hoist in your garage. So it's not like uh, a convertible car where you could just push a button and fold the roof back. It, you know, that'd be amazing if it was, but that's not what you get with a Jeep. So just be aware of that and really do research on what top you want on your Jeep. So moving to the interior of the Gladiator. Uh, what are the things I like? What are the things I don't like? So one of the big factors that really swayed me and convinced me to go ahead and finally get a Jeep after never owning a Jeep my whole life was the improvements they've made to the interior quality, the refinement, the choices of materials, and just how everything works. It's really, really impressive on the new generation of Jeeps, whether it's the Wrangler JL or the Gladiator JT. So like I mentioned, the quality of all the knobs, button, and switches, how everything feels is actually fairly upscale. Um, it's not like the older Jeeps, even if you get into a JK generation Jeep Wrangler, it feels like a rental car. Sorry, no offense to JK owners, but it really does. But that's gone with the JL and with the JT. Uh, the materials are nice, they're soft touch. Um, it looks and feels like a higher end, more premium vehicle. And I think that's a good thing because this is not a cheap vehicle. I like how all the buttons are laid out. Everything is easy to find. There's hard buttons for things like your steering wheel heaters, your seat heaters, um, your engine stop start, uh, parking sensors, 
you know, controls for the screen. Your climate control uses physical controls, but you can also use the screen as well. Now I have the larger 8-inch uh, Uconnect infotainment, which I highly recommend getting. At least get the medium-sized screen. Don't get the tiny screen that the base level ones have. I think there's like a, there's three options. The middle or the big screen is what you want to get. So I've got that, and I've got a lot of the fancy stuff like adaptive cruise control. Uh, but anyway, the point is that I really like how everything looks, how everything feels, how everything works. And if you're getting into this for the first time, it's going to be pretty easy to operate. The only things that feel maybe a tiny bit cheap uh, might be like the turn signal and the headlight um, stocks. They're not that bad. They just don't feel maybe quite as good quality as all the rest of the stuff. I like the circular air vents. They're very easy to adjust right where you want. And I think they look cool with the silver trim. I even like the red dashboard that the Rubicon has, although different trim levels have different setups with that. Um, of course, you've got a manual transfer case, so actual mechanical engagement for your four wheel drive, which is one of the only vehicles in the world that has that. Uh, I've got the aux switches. I've got all my off-road controls down here. Uh, overall, I'm very impressed with the interior. What about the, the, what about the seating room? So um, if you're very tall, you're going to really want to spend some time testing this because tall drivers have really said that they have a problem with it, getting the seat far back enough. They can't get the seat far back enough to get comfortable. So if you're over six feet tall, uh, you might really want to check into that before you buy one. Uh, otherwise, I would say the seating comfort is below average. The seats on Jeeps, uh, at least the Wranglers and the Gladiators of this generation, are pretty bad. The, the bolstering, the padding, it's just not good quality. The lumbar support is not enough. And for long drives, it's just not very comfortable. Um, sorry, that's just the way it is, and I know most other journalists uh, would agree with me on that. However, it's not horrible. You're not going to notice it like after maybe a two-hour drive, but if you do a four-hour drive, a six-hour drive, you're going to notice that you're not as comfortable as you are in most other modern cars. In terms of the actual room, I think it's pretty decent. Um, like I mentioned, the front seat room issue for some people. Uh, for me, it's perfectly fine. I did install also an aftermarket dead pedal because one complaint is that it does not come with a dead pedal to rest your left foot, which is stupid, so I put one in. The back seat room is very good and better than something like a Tacoma or Frontier. I don't know about the new Frontier, but I know the older ones. Uh, class leading back seat room, which I think was great because I've had other midsize trucks. I had a Chevy Colorado, and this is definitely more back seat room than that Colorado I had, and more back seat room than my friends who have Tacomas. So that's something nice. If you're going to put car seats in, you're going to put people back there, that's a nice thing to have. There is one other thing I don't like about the interior, and this is a functionality thing, is that there's not a whole lot of storage. So they do their best, but the thing is with the Jeep, because the doors are removable, they're kind of flat. They don't have big indentations for like big cup holders. So you don't get cup holders in the doors. You get these storage nets, which are useful, but you can't put drinks in them really. I mean, I guess you could try. Everything is just kind of compact because it's a fairly narrow vehicle for a truck. You, you have two uh, cup holders here in the middle, um, this storage cubby, this storage tray is something I added uh, for this grab handle. It's like a cheap Amazon item you can add. But otherwise, you know, if you want to put your phone, if you want to put your wallet, you want to get a bunch of drinks and stuff, uh, there is a center uh, storage compartment, but it's not very big. It's just a bit lacking compared to some other vehicles you might be used to. So really check into that and look at that before you decide to plunk down money for one of these and make sure that the storage is going to be enough for you. One last thing I wanted to mention that I really do appreciate is that the truck has rear seat air vents. So heating and cooling goes to the back passengers, which is a really great thing to have. So how is a Jeep Gladiator like to live with on a daily basis? Let's talk about things like getting in and out of it, parking it, fuel economy, things like that. Uh, so let me start with the fuel economy. A lot of people ask about that. So the vehicle has an EPA rating. I'll put that down below here. Um, but the thing with the EPA rating is that the first time you start doing any sort of mods, you put on bigger tires or different tires, or you put on a lift, you add more wind drag by putting tents on it or lights, your mileage is going to go down. And so when this vehicle was bone stock and it was brand new, which wasn't for long because I did mods pretty soon, but I was getting like around 18, 19 um, combined average, which I think is about what the EPA says, which wasn't bad. Then when I did the mods, I think it's the larger mud terrain tires that really kind of hurt things, although I don't even have a lift on this. My mileage went down to around uh, 16 or so, usually combined average. Uh, that's not towing and not hauling anything heavy, right? So I think that's not too bad for really what this is. For a vehicle that is like a serious rock crawling machine that's also a truck, that's not much worse than a lot of the other uh, trucks that I've had. 
I want to mention the size of the Gladiator. Some people forget that this is still a mid-sized truck. The thing I like about a mid-sized truck as compared to a full-size truck is that it's about five or six inches narrower. Uh, now, what that means for you is that parking, getting in and out of tight areas, um, driving through the city, urban environments, this is a lot more practical, a lot more livable day to day than a full size or heavy duty truck would be. I've owned both full size and mid-size trucks. I even have a, have a video comparing this, which I'll link to. But I really, the size of the Gladiator is, is not too big, it's not too small. And that's one of the other factors that really convinced me to get this because I kind of got tired of maneuvering full-size trucks around uh, the city and going to Costco, things like that. So I like the smaller size. Let's talk about getting in and out of it, getting uh, your wife in and out of it, getting you know kids and car seats and stuff. It's not terrible. Uh, the step in for the rear is a little awkward because you've got that kind of cut um, going into the door, the, the way the body panel fits. Um, it's a high vehicle, especially if you lift it or put larger tires on it. Um, so yeah, I recommend getting the little grab handles, the aftermarket ones, which I have, so you can kind of pull yourself up in. Um, but overall, day to day, I think it's decent. Now, the truck bed. So yeah, it's a, short, it's a small bed. You can only get a five foot bed with a Gladiator. There's no option for a larger bed. So the vehicle only comes in this one wheelbase. Um, it's a five foot bed. I mean, you're not gonna haul long, big, oversized items in it. So it is what it is. You have to get used to that. You have to accept that. Know the limitations of that going in. Five feet is not is a pretty small bed. Um, although most people buy full size F-150s and Silverados with five and a half foot beds. So this is not much worse, but keep in mind, it's also a little bit narrower than a full size truck. So if you look at the volume, it's actually significantly less. What about the off-road capabilities of the Gladiator? A lot of people look at the Gladiator and think, oh, it's not really a Jeep, it's like this truck, it doesn't look like it'd be very good. Let me tell you something right now. The Gladiator, especially if you get like a Mojave or a Rubicon, but even the lower level trims, these things are absolutely unstoppable on the trail. And let me kind of tell you why that is. So Jeeps are still using a solid front axle. What that means for you is that the articulation is incredible. You can drop this thing through huge ruts and go through terrain that you might look at the terrain if you're not an off-road driver person and think, oh, there's no way a vehicle could even navigate that. And then this thing goes through it like it's nothing. That's seriously how good it is. So you can tell I'm pretty passionate about this aspect of the Gladiator, so I'll try not to go on and on. But what you need to know is that um, this is not the same as like a Tacoma or uh, you know, uh, a Chevy Colorado or a 4Runner or a Nissan Frontier or anything like that. Those are good vehicles and you can get some really good capability out of them. But this is on another playing field, especially if you go to the Mojave or really the Rubicon, especially with the things I talked about, the front locker, the disconnecting sway bar. Especially once you start adding a couple inches of ground clearance, larger tires and a small lift, these things can go places that you just would not even believe. Uh, the other good things about it off-road is because the little bit longer wheelbase actually makes it ride smoother than like uh, Wrangler and smoother than some other SUVs and smaller vehicles. Uh, it's very stable and it's just, it's just pleasing and uh, enjoyable to drive whether you're on like more touring, like off-road touring, like fire roads, or whether you're in like rock crawling or really difficult situations. Now where the Gladiator is gonna struggle off-road compared to its smaller cousin, the Wrangler, is in two main areas. Because it's a much longer vehicle, it is a truck, obviously, uh, it struggles with the breakover angle and the departure angle. So think of the breakover angle as um, when you go over an obstacle with the front tires and you're going over like a hill, um, you'll slide your belly, kind of like a lizard, like on the ground, right? So it wants to slide its undercarriage uh, because it's a long vehicle and it, it just can't mountain goat over stuff like the smaller Wrangler can. Ow! Ow! You're hurting my Jeep. I'm looking for the Starbucks. <laughs> The other thing is the departure angle. So because of the overhang um, that goes behind the rear tires, you will catch on like rocks as you're departing an obstacle, you will kind of hit down on the rear rock sliders. Now I highly recommend if you're gonna do any sort of serious off-roading with your Gladiator, uh, that you have rock sliders that go all the way back because even in the off-roading I've done, which is not even considered extreme, I've used the rock sliders. I've slid on rocks and boulders with all the rock sliders all the way back to the rear bumper and including even the tow hitch. So that's something that you're gonna wanna have so you don't do damage to the body of the vehicle. 
Now, as I say all this, it's important to mention that off-roading means different things to different people. I'm not talking about like high-speed desert running, like dune jumping or the crazy like social media hype stuff that you see out there, which in actuality, as someone who goes out and does these things, doesn't really exist because where can you go 80 or 100 miles an hour through a sand dune or down a desert road uh, without either getting arrested or killing someone on a dirt bike or a side-by-side -side or going to a national park or, or whatever? There's really not places to do that. So vehicles to me, like a Raptor or the Ram TRX, they're mostly for wealthy people to show off driving around the city. And no offense, because those are cool vehicles, I like them too, uh, and I did look at the Raptor uh, before I bought this, but the off-roading that I end up doing is like rocks and um, difficult mountain trails and negotiating obstacles. It's not going like 80 miles an hour through the desert because that's something you see in advertisements and in uh, clickbait social media stuff, but it's not really reality uh, for most people. So the actual kind of trail riding, off-roading that Jeep people do, this is very good at. It's not for that high speed, you know, crazy desert jumping stuff. Although the Mojave version does have better suspension that's able to cope with those higher speeds than the Rubicon does. So how does this new Gladiator drive on the highway? So there's two ways of looking at this. If you're gonna compare this to uh, most modern vehicles, whether it's a crossover SUV or sedan or even a full-size truck, it doesn't have the quiet, it doesn't have the refinement, it doesn't have the smoothness, it's loud, um, it gets blown around by the wind. It is a tall, boxy object with a solid front axle, so the steering feels kind of loose and it wanders a bit compared to other vehicles. That's a trade-off you get with having that solid front axle system, which is considered a very, very old-fashioned system compared to independent front suspension, but it gives you that off-road ability that we've been talking about, which is unique to this vehicle. Now, the other way of looking at this is if you're coming from like an older Jeep Wrangler or maybe a two-door Wrangler, uh, something like that, this is actually like a limousine on the highway compared to that. It rides well because of that longer wheelbase and the, the softly sprung suspension. It, it glides over things. It, it tracks pretty well compared to older Jeeps. And overall, it's perfectly acceptable for me on the highway. It doesn't get the greatest mileage. It's not the quietest. It does get blown around in crosswinds. The steering requires more input to keep it straight because of the solid axle, but if you know that and you can live with all that, then you're gonna be just fine. But just know those things going in, do some good test drives with it, and don't expect that this is gonna be like uh, a luxurious like trim level of a full-size truck and the way those are so quiet, smooth, and refined. It's just not that. It trades off some of that highway refinement for that off-road ability. Um, but it's still pretty good and I think it's gonna be good enough for most people. So I promise we're gonna cover towing really briefly. Now, I have a whole separate video, a very detailed video on towing with the Gladiator. Back when we used to have our Lance 1685 travel trailer, which weighed around 5,500 pounds was the gross vehicle weight on that. So I go into detail in that video, but here's the brief version of that. Uh, the vehicle is set up really well in terms of its stability, its suspension, its braking, and everything feels very solid for towing up to around 5,000 pounds. But here's where it kind of falls down. With the Pentastar V6 engine, it just doesn't have a lot of torque. And what it means is that the engine has to work pretty hard to get weight like up a hill or up mountains or over mountain passes. This is where you really feel that V6 and sort of its lack of torque. Come on. So, I would not use this for long distance towing with anything over like maybe 3,500 or 4,000 pounds. It just feels too strained in my opinion. Now other people would disagree with that and that's fine. But again, go watch that towing video and you can see in depth how this thing works towing a travel trailer. Now, if you wanna tow something smaller, like I tow, nowadays what I tow mostly is a motorcycle trailer that's when it's loaded up, it's probably around 2,000 pounds at most. And it's perfectly great with that. No problems towing that. Um, like I said, the brakes, the stability, how everything feels, it feels very good. And it has much more towing capacity uh, than something like a Wrangler, just because it's a truck. It's longer, it's stronger, it's designed for towing in a way that something like a Wrangler isn't. And actually for a mid-sized truck, it's very, very good at towing if you look at the ratings. 
So we're getting near to the end of this video, so let's start to wrap up and talk about what I love and what I don't love about the Gladiator. Uh, so the things I love really go back to what I talked about with why I bought it. And the great news is that all those reasons I bought it have really held true in my experience with owning it. So the versatility is what I love. The fact that I can go rock crawling one weekend with a group of Jeep Wranglers, like in a Jeep club, the next weekend tow a trailer with it, the next week take my family around in it, uh, I can haul things in the bed. It does, for me, everything I need to do in my life, except for being a sports car, which obviously it's not a sports car, uh, but it does so much so well that it would be extremely, extremely difficult to replace. And frankly, there, there is no substitute for this for the things that I wanna do with it. The second favorite thing that I love about it, and I've talked about this, is the off-road ability. It's simply incredible off-road where you can go. It gives you a level of confidence that you're just not gonna have in most other uh, trucks or SUVs, and it's really amazing to have that capability. I've also touched on this a little bit, but I love the fact that you can take the roof off and you can take the doors off. That adds so much cool factor and fun factor, even if you only do it a few times a year, how many other vehicles have that? And how many other, it's the only truck that has that. I mean, it's crazy that adding to all its other versatility that you can still get that fun, that cool factor by taking the doors off, the, the roof off, and even folding down the windshield if you really want to get crazy. I just think that's amazing and I do enjoy doing that when the weather's nice. I mentioned the interior. I really like the interior quality. It feels like a high-end premium vehicle. It doesn't feel cheap like the older generations of Jeeps did. And again, I'm sorry if I'm offending some people who have the older Jeeps, but um, get in a JL or a JT. You're going to be really impressed with how nice the interior is. I really like the technology as well. Uh, the Uconnect system is very good in the car industry for the controls and how you can use all your functions on the screen. Uh, the cameras are really sharp. The technology is well integrated. It's easy to use and it's the best of any vehicle that I've used. And finally, what I love is the customization potential. We've talked about that already, but there's so many things you can do to make it your own. And if you get bored with it after a year or two, you can change something up and that might keep you interested in it and keep you in the vehicle versus trading it in for something else. So what are the things that I don't like about the Gladiator? Well, I have maybe three or four main complaints about it. The first complaint I have is that the suspension is way too soft. Here's what I mean. When you go through a dip, like on the highway, or if you're going off road and you go through a big dip, it bottoms out. It's either the valving in the shocks or the spring rates are simply too soft. And for the way I like to drive and the way most people drive, it simply bottoms out all the time, especially in the back. It just feels like something is way too soft and I really don't like that. And it's one of the first things I'm gonna address in terms of either changing the springs, maybe going to a small lift or changing the shocks or doing all of that, just because I can't stand how, how squishy it is and how much it just kind of floats, especially in the back end. So I don't like that and that's something that I definitely wanna fix. The second main complaint I have has to do with the Pentastar V6 engine. I mentioned how I chose the gas engine over the diesel engine for lower weight for better reliability and all that is true. But here's one downside. It was designed as a car engine for powering sedans and minivans. What that means is that it doesn't have a lot of low end torque. So it makes all of its power up high in the RPM range. So once you rev it over 5,000 RPM, sure, the horsepower is there. It's like 285 or something, which is fine. But the problem is below 5,000 RPM, it just doesn't have enough torque for a truck. And I would love to see um, Stellantis do a larger engine like a larger V6 even like a 4 liter V6 or a 3.8 something with more low-end torque would work wonders for this and would um, I think you know negate the need maybe for having that diesel engine that some people are upgrading to um, so a larger V6 would be very very welcome and yeah I, d I don't like the lack of torque of the Pentastar V6 so here are my final thoughts on the Jeep Gladiator you can tell I really enjoy this vehicle I really do. I'm really being honest. This is not just to get views or clicks or whatever. I really do like this truck. And of all the vehicles I bought and they were used, um, this is the one that's come closest to meeting my expectations and making me feel like I got a good value. It is expensive. This Gladiator was over $60,000 on the sticker price. I paid less than that. I paid around $55,000 for it because I know you're going to ask that. Um, but that was before the shortages and all this craziness kicked in. I bought this one year ago, so it was before all this weird stuff started happening in the automotive marketplace. Would I buy this again? Yes, in a heartbeat. Uh, I love most things about it. I mentioned the things I don't like about it, but frankly, there's no substitute for me with the things I wanna do. Off-roading, towing, hauling people around, having a truck bed, uh, the looks, the customization, the fact that I can, it's a convertible. 
there's nothing, there's no substitute for me for this vehicle. So I love it. And yeah, if this was totaled, I would actually buy another one. Even though there's so many other cool vehicles out there, the Gladiator just has that right combination of things that work for my lifestyle. Whether it works for your lifestyle, you're gonna have to consider everything I've said in this video and see if it makes sense for you. One last thing I know that people are gonna ask, so I'll just get it out of the way now. Have I had any issues with it? No, I haven't had a single issue with it. It's never had to go back to the Jeep dealer. Um, it's been flawless. I mean, nothing has broken. Nothing's been weird with the software. I haven't had any issues that would cause me to take it back to the dealer. Also, there's been no recalls or any TSBs that I've been aware of that would cause me to take it back to the dealer. So that's been a good experience. So I hope that answers that question. So I know this was a bit of a long video, but I really wanted to go into detail because this is a serious purchase. If you're looking at one, it's a serious investment. It's a serious vehicle. And I really want you to have all the information that I can possibly give you. Now, questions, comments, you want further information, put it down below in the comments. I read and respond to every comment on both my YouTube channels. A lot of you know me from Big Rock Moto, but this Big Rock Outdoors channel is something that I'll be growing more in the future. Um, but I do, I'm very interactive with my audience. So again, let me know what questions you have, what comments you have, what has your experience been, um, and share, you know, would you, would you consider buying one of these? Or if you have one, have you been happy with it? So I sincerely hope that this video has been very useful for you. If it has, please do all the normal things, subscribe, hit the bell, hit the thumbs up button, leave a comment. Uh, I also have a Patreon page which supports both Big Rock Moto and Big Rock Outdoors if you wanna do that. And if you want like this Big Rock Moto merchandise, I'll put a link to that here below, although that's mostly I know for the people on the motorcycle channel. So thanks again for watching. I sincerely hope this was useful. Um, otherwise, uh, we'll see you on the next video. Ride safe, drive safe, see you soon.